start teleporting, you need to know what a broken track is. A broken track is not ground blocks. A broken track is when you select <laughs> two or more tracks, you put a claw on the leftmost of the tracks. So or the bot either the bottom or the leftmost. So if you're doing just two vertical ones, you'll put on the bottom one. That's gonna screw it. You also need to do it in one go. So if you do stuff in between putting the claw on the track and doing stuff, that's gonna mess it up. Because this is all undo tech. When you put a hammer bro in the claw, you make it big. You play, then pause, then press undo. If you did it optimally, it'll be four times, but if you did stuff in between, it'll be more than four. You just do it until the track breaks. And you can delete the claw and the hammer bro, and you'll have a broken track. I find it easier if you're doing a lot of undo stuff. You use a D-pad to press right, down, down, and then you can undo much faster by pressing A, A, A on the undo, then waiting and holding each time. Sure. So a broken track is just going to act like a regular track for the most part, right? Yes. Um, there are a bunch of useful stuff you can do, such as this. You can transfer something onto a second track horizontally without having to use any kind of verticality. And that will just stay on the... The Goomba will stay on this track here. Uh, uh, an example of where this was used it was in Warrior's Trolled Mine, which is a Stevo level. Stevo wanted to insert a seesaw from the side because he was hiding it behind a second seesaw. Damn it. But he didn't want it. But if you were to hide it behind, he needed it to stay at the same horizontal position. So he had to make it come in from the side without come, without any sort of vertical movement. So this is how he did it. Awesome. So what happens uh, to make a broken track teleport? Okay, to make it teleport, you do two things. You draw a track here and you make it curved. That is everything you need to know in video. <laughs> uh, right, so if, uh, if an object goes off of a broken track and tries to transfer onto a curved track like this, it'll teleport. Yes, it doesn't have to be a horizontal track. You can do like broken track that goes uh, right, then up. There's, like, different orientations you can use. And as long as the broken tr part of the track leads into a curved track, it will teleport. So that would work as well. Anyway, um... When something goes off a broken track, it will teleport to the bottom left of the level. Uh, this is pretty easy to do in the sub world, but we'll just show this here for now. So when that hard block goes off the end, it'll disappear, and it will reappear down here in the bottom left corner. Because I guess that's some sort of default value thing. And then it'll immediately despawn, because it's like too far off the screen, right? Uh, it's a block on a track, so it won't, but if there was, if it was something that could despawn, it would. However, if it's been on a curved track already, it will teleport back to that instead. So the default value is replaced by the last curve track it was on. And then it does a little weird squiggly thingy when it... It does a little weird thing. Gets back on it. I think that it's because it assumes that the curve track is in that orientation. I wonder what this will do. No, it just goes down and does the exact opposite thing. Weird. So it does a little weird thing when it teleports, and then it you can make it loop continuously doing this. Uh, this is how Soup Bowl did the screen wrap uh, simulation yes. in their level. I forget what the name of that level was. Endless Soup? Endless yeah. Soup. Um, and it chooses the most recent curve track. Uh, it went over two, but it chose this one. Got it. Cool. Okay. All right, but... I don't just want to teleport stuff on tracks, I want to use it to teleport stuff that's not on tracks. Okay. So there are three, four types of teleportation, so we're going to do like segments into this video. So the first uh, type of teleportation we're going to cover is carrying teleportation. So actually let's move to the subworld because it's easier without the start ground there. Uh, carry teleportation is when you 
have an item going off a broken track and it carries an item with it off the broken track. Uh, and it's really difficult to do two things at once. Okay, so you have an item going off a broken track and it carries an item going off a broken track, usually a block, and it can carry an item with it, such as uh, this piranha. Let's use a pal, because piranhas can sometimes die when this happens. And oh, even though the block will go to the bottom left, we have to see it here, the pal will get caught on different ground blocks, and the pal will end up here, because it gets caught on the ground blocks. Even though you can see the block on tracks goes to the bottom left, the pal gets caught in the uh, gets caught midway. So it gets carried from A to B. So let's start by talking about the process by which the game decides where the item that's teleporting is going to end up. Um, in order to do so, it's going to go around in a loop through a bunch of different relevant rows and columns that we'll talk about as they come up. Yes. So the first thing that you have to remember is where the item teleports from. We call this the teleportation location. Row and okay. column. Yes. Teleportation row, the teleportation column. These are going to be very important. In this so, case, it's one to the right of where the POW is right now. Yes, if I press play, the place where the POW is when it disappears is roughly here. Great. Um, the second important location here is, in this case, it's going to be column two. And this is this is what we call the scanning column. Yes. Um, and this, uh, it doesn't matter if we are way over to the right in the level, it's always going to be way over here on the left, the, the first couple of columns. Um, it's possible to select different columns for this, but that's going to, we'll cover that later. In this case, as in most cases, our scanning column is column two. Yes. Um, so the first thing that's going to happen is that the POW is going to look at the scanning column and try to fall. So we get a second POW. If you, if you imagine this POW goes off on a little journey, the row that it's on is what we will call the teleportation row. So it's the row it was at when it teleported. It will start at that height or that row and it will scan downwards along the scanning column until it finds something solid. In this case, it will find this ground block. Great. And this is going to select the scanning row. Now, remember, during all of this time, the POW has no physics. This is all happening just within the engine. Yes, um, this is an instantaneous to... thing. Um, so you have to imagine it falling and hitting a solid. Once it hits a solid, where it ends up is going to select the scanning row. Yes. So it will select this row here as the scanning row. So now it's going to teleport all the way back to the column where it started, the teleportation column, right there. No physics still. Um, and it's going to try and go left until it hits a solid. In this case, it goes right there. Bop. And this is the destination column. This is where the this is the column where the power is going to end up. Again, still no physics, still just this is all virtual. Finally, the POW is going to snap back up to the row where it started, right there, and attempt to fall. And right there is the destination. That's where the POW is going to end up. Only after this point does the POW gain physics and push along the destination row. We'll get into pushing a little bit more later, but the, at that point, the POW is going to have physics and it's going to push as if it had teleported from its origin down to the destination row and just push left until it ends up in this spot. Now, it's a very complicated way of it determining where it ends up, um, but there's a lot of the, the advantage is there's a lot of places where you can actually control this. Great. As an experiment, let's try adding some blocks in the scanning row to move yes. this destination to the right a little bit. So our scanning row is here. If we add a block here, it will still scan along this scanning row from the teleportation column 
leftwards until it finds something solid, but it will find this block here instead of this block. So that means your destination column is going to be this column instead of this column. Great. So that means it, it will teleport to session right here. Need to go. Beautiful. Now, what happens if you have something that's taller than one block, like a launcher? With a launcher, all your scanning rows, your teleportation rows, and your destination rows, every row that you're talking about is going to be two rows because the launcher is two tiles tall. So your teleportation row, it goes leftwards until it hits the left of the level. Theoretically, this is all, it doesn't have any physics whilst we're doing this, if you remember what Janine said. It's just a mind exercise. It will scan downwards along your scanning column until it hits something solid. That selects your scanning rows, rows plural, because it's a two tile tall thing. If it had been three tiles tall, it would be three rows that you're scanning rows. Mm -hmm. But it selects these two rows as your scanning rows. Uh, I should copy this instead of moving it around. No, this is this is fine. This is fine. Okay. So then it will go along the it will scan along the scanning row until it hits something solid. Uh, which is this block. That decides your destination column which your destination column is still only one column because this is one tile thick. If it had been a two by two thing, let's say we've got a big cannon, both your, every column you're talking about and every row you're talking about will be two rows and two columns. The thing that we said we were gonna come back to is how do you decide the scanning column? Right, why was it column two in all of these cases? Okay, so now instead of a copy of this power, we're gonna grab a copy of this platform. And I'm gonna put this platform here. So if you imagine these two platforms this are the same platform, you any pla anything that teleports off a broken track, so this could be a hard block on a track, uh, a platform on a track, a seesaw on a track, whatever you want, that's gonna get mapped with a one-to-one -one mapping on the left side of the screen. On, centered on column two. So if you look at the center of this platform, middle block, it's going to be mapped to column two. And but relative to where the power is on this platform, that's going to be where the, the scanning column is relative to this platform. So I'm, if I move this POW right one, so it's on the middle plus one, let's, let's assume that right is plus one and left is minus one. So if it's right plus one, it's gonna be column two plus one. It's gonna go to column three if the power is here. We can make this platform as big as we want. So if it's if the power is here instead, let's move it there. It's gonna be column it's gonna be the middle plus one plus two plus three. Right, so you have to imagine that the center of the platform that's teleporting is going to be column two. Yes. And if you if that was on column two, where would that power be? And that's how you select the scanning column. Yes. So if it's three to the right of the center of the platform, it's going to be column two plus three. So we end up on column five. So yeah, if you're watching this and you're trying to figure this out, just mess around, experiment, see if you can set something up, guess where it's going to end up, and then watch it go there. That's the best way to get good at this kind of stuff. This next example about teleporting spike balls relies on a little bit of knowledge about placeholders. If you're not familiar with placeholders, we're going to do a little explanation here, but for a more in-depth uh, explanation, uh, Loop and Snoop has, or Loop of Loop and Snoop has a great video on how to use um, placeholders. Assisted loading and placeholders. Yes, yes, assisted loading, I think it's called. Anyway, we'll link it somewhere. Yes, we'll link it in the description. But the basic gist is if a, a spike ball in this case, if anything that usually moves or usually has uh, behavior is off screen, and but is also touching one of a few types of platform, a blue platform is one of these, it won't, its, beha its normal behaviors won't start. So a spike ball won't roll, a, um, a Goomba won't walk, Let's see. A mushroom won't slide around. A mushroom a... might walk around, yeah. 
bomb won't explode, etc. Th that's actually really important for us because we want to control where the spike belt is on the platform when it's yes. when it's going to teleport. Um, because if it was rolling around, then it might select the wrong column and then do all sorts of weird things. Yeah. So if we map this blue platform using the scanning column method, your middle column is going to be column two. So the scanning columns that it select it selects, assuming the spike wall doesn't roll, is going to be column two. Column three is going to select columns four and five. If the spike ball maintains its position, if it rolls to the left when you press play, it will select a different column or it will select something in between. It's not like it doesn't snap to a column, it'll be like in between if the spike ball's like mid roll. So spike ball teleportation. What's it what's it do? Show me. With spike ball teleportation, you can have magical stuff happen, such as this. We have these four blocks and only these four blocks breaking, and we have these four note blocks and only these four note blocks getting hit from the side remotely. So if we had something in them, uh, let's say a winged pal, or a thousand and twenty-four winged coins, perhaps, if you have <laughs> four note blocks, that would you could crash the game with that. But basically, it allows remote activation or remote breaking of many different things. If you've played Wagon World, you've noticed that there are a lot of places where just for some reason a bunch of blocks hit themselves um, or seem to. And that is that is what we have used spike ball teleportation for. Um, it is extremely versatile. It's very useful. It can be used to clean up a lot of setups and it's fairly sprite efficient as well. So definitely, definitely a technique worth learning. There are two main directions you can use spike ball teleporting. Horizontal and vertical. So currently we are using it horizontally. Or well, you, you, you always use it both horizontally and vertically, but generally you only use make though one of those your use case. So our use case currently is we're gonna use it horizontally to break or to break slash activate everything in this row two rows here. So if you see everything in those two rows, either gets broken or hit. Can you show me what happens if it's a small spike ball? Yes, I can. And maybe with some question mark blocks in the mix. Right, so a small spike ball is going to affect one row and it's going to hit things rather than destroy them because that's what small spike balls do. Yes. It will just give the effect of a small spike ball rolling into it. That's what it will do. The second um, way of doing it or well, the second use case for it is vertical activation. So in this example, we've got this entire vertical column of hard blocks being hit. If we put um, note blocks here, they would be hit as well, but from above, not from the side. Got it. So if you see those, they all get hit downwards. So these get the effect of a spike ball falling on them. Yes. Got it. Now, a spike with teleporting will always do both. You always get a horizontal row getting activated slash broken. And for this example, that is this row here. And you will always get a vertical column being activated slash jumped on for these note blocks. There are similar rules to the carry teleportation but there's a slight variation of them to decide which row and which column. Awesome. That. So what are those rules? Okay. So, our teleporting thing is now slightly off screen here so that the spiral doesn't roll before it teleports. And we are also putting it on the fur further right of the platform just so it can be nearer to screen. So, if you see what the position of the spike ball is relative to the platform, we can do a mapping of the platform onto left of the level. So if you imagine uh, your columns, this is corresponds to x equals 2, x equals 3, x equals 4, 
and these would be x equals 5 and x equals 6. So if we go back over to the left of the level, x equals 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So your scanning columns are still x equals 5 and x equals 6. That's the same as before. Where it diverges is from here. So you're going to scan downwards along your uh, scanning column from the height that it teleported from. So from your teleportation row along your teleportation column. So our teleportation row is this row. And our teleportation column is x equals 5 and 6. 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. I'm going to delete everything else just to make it simpler. So our teleportation row is this one. Our teleportation our scanning column is this one. It's only going to fall one tail down and before it hits something solid. Got it. And that sets our scanning row, scanning rows plural, as these two rows. Your scanning row is the set of rows that it will go across activating everything. So if you see here, Interesting. I can put some note blocks there that's the row that will get activated so unlike the previous one where when it was scanning along the scanning rows it didn't have any physics the spike ball does have interactions with blocks along its scanning row yes yeah that's really interesting okay moving back to the to what we were talking about before with carry teleportation once you've gone down your scanning column to find your scanning row, you go back to the teleportation column, which is all the way over here, and you scan, and then you have your scanning row, and you scan along it from the right to the left. So we go left until we hit a solid block. Now for spike balls, hard blocks don't count as solid blocks. Neither do brick blocks or anything breakable. So it's going to scan leftwards until it hits these two ground blocks. That decide, in our carrying teleportation train of thought, that would decide your destination column, or your destination columns. And that is happens to be these two columns. So with teleporting spike balls, the rows that get activated are your scanning rows, and the columns that get activated are your destination columns. Got it. Okay, that's fairly simple. So it follows mostly the same rules as the regular carry teleportation, except that it actually hits everything from the side on the scanning row, and hits everything from the top on the destination column. Yes. Rather than just ending up in a place, it actually interacts with all of the blocks. Yes. Also note that it doesn't do the entire column, it does the column from the teleportation row downwards from that point. So it's not going to break these two blocks here because those are above where this battle teleported from. So you see that on the top three. Because, yeah, right. it goes from the scanning row downwards. Because spike balls can't fall up. They only fall down. Spike balls can't fall upwards, yeah. So these blocks are safe. Everything downwards gets activated or broken. And now something to keep in mind if you're using this is that this will break everything in the scanning row to the left of the teleportation. Yes. So if um, we move if this you're... all the way... Yeah over to the right like really really far over here and then i think i managed to maintain that yeah it's still two tiles from the top if i put a switch all the way here i think that may need to be downward downward be down yeah. one because this is our scanning row even though that's on the scanning row no that's on the scanning row but even though it's all the way over there switches are super global which means they are always loaded so that switch is going to get hit by this spike ball, even though we are all the way on the other side of the level. And I can prove that to you by... Okay, the reason that didn't work is because the spike ball started rolling. So That's it was correct, no longer yeah. relative <laughs> to... It was no longer picking the same scanning column. So if I move this... If we just go down. Over, yeah, if I move this downwards. So this platform is... So the spike ball is off screen, it won't roll. Damn it. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, move it up, I think. Move the switch up. 
the the spike ball on platform. That should be off screen enough. No, I think it was it was too low to hit the correct. Uh... Let's go. Damn it! Must <laughs> be teaching people. <laughs> oh. Let's just move make... the switch to the right. Oh, that's interesting, actually. No, that it was picking the scanning rope, but it only goes from the tele from the teleportation column along the scanning row until it hits the scanning column. The stuff over here is safe. Interesting. Okay. Okay, there you go. We got a new discovery. The more okay, you I know. Put this switch here. It won't get activated. No switch. But if I move it right. So it's further along the scanning row, it should get activated. There you go. There it is. Um, and this is important because if you're using this to break blocks in your level, it will also break blocks in those columns on every room to the left of where you're <laughs> using it. So be very careful. Um, yes. The rooms where you're putting teleporting spike walls, you will want to move it as far left in your subworld or main world as you can. Unless you want to multitask and do like huge macro stuff and affect other rooms that are off screen and yeah, that's, that's and very useful for like macro draws because it can affect rooms that are like half the level away. Uh, yes. This is what we did in the bandwagon finale where we uh, affected other things when you went into the metal land section uh, with yes. a spike ball teleport. When we come back, we'll talk about how to teleport the player. We'll talk about how to speed up the teleportation because tracks are kind of slow and not great in a number of ways and we'll talk about push teleportation which has some slightly different rules um, and can be very more convenient for some kinds of setups yes anyway thanks for watching hope you learned something and uh we'll see you next time spam that subscribe button or something or something <laughs> goodbye bye